the door. A storyette of real distinction. Those in the motor car hardly felt the slight, though sickening, impact. It was rather, indeed, because of the instinct for something gone wrong than because of conviction that he had struck anything more important than a roll of tangled burlap from some passing moving van that the driver brought his heavy car to a stop with a grinding of brakes strenuously applied and went back to see what he had struck he had turned the corner almost incidentally but when he alighted and went back when the thin gleam of his flashlight revealed to him the heap of huddled pulp that lay there the driver realized in the throes of a hideous nausea what it was his heavy machine had spun and crushed roger phillips intent upon the first really decent act of his whole life hardly noticed what was forward he had been crossing the street he continued to be intent on his own concerns interrupted only by a kind of cold shudder to which he gave only passing thought as if with the very outer edges of his mind he did not stop but crossed the sidewalk looking up as he had done many times before to assure himself that the lights were out in the living room of the apartment up there on the third floor of the apartment house they were out as he had confidently anticipated and reassured he quickly mounted the stairs to the front entrance someone came out hurriedly and passed him as he entered the rush taking him by surprise he turned his head as quickly as he could to avoid recognition it was old mr oster his father's neighbor who had rushed out the elderly man was in his shirt sleeves and appeared greatly agitated so much so that young phillips was certain he had not been recognized hardly even noticed indeed he breathed an audible sigh of relief he did not want old oster to mention this chance meeting to his father the next time he should see him and he knew oster to be gregarious the young man mounted lightly and hurriedly the two flights of steps that led to the door of his father's apartment he thrust his key into the patent lock of the apartment door confidently almost without thought a mechanical motion as mechanically he turned the key to the right it was an old key and it fit the keyhole easily he knew that his father and mother were at the symphony concert they had not missed one for years during the season for symphony concerts and this was their regular night he had chosen this night for that reason he knew the colored maid was out too he had seen her not five minutes earlier getting on a car to boston the coast as he phrased the thought to himself somewhat melodramatically was clear he was certain of security from interruption only let him get safely into the apartment do what he had to do and as quietly and unobtrusively depart and he would be satisfied quite satisfied but the lock offered unexpected resistance it was inexplicable irritating his over tense nerves revolted abruptly at this check the key had slipped into the slot as always without difficulty but it would not turn furiously he twisted it this way and that at last he removed it and stared at it curiously there was nothing amiss with the key could his father have had the lock changed anger and quick shame smote him suddenly he looked closely at the lock no it was unchanged there were the numberless tiny scratch marks of innumerable insertions it was the same gingerly carefully he inserted the key again he turned it to the right of course it turned to the right he remembered that clearly he had so turned it 
countless times. But it did not move. He put out all his puny strength, and still it would not turn. Hot exasperation shook him, as he swore under his breath in his irritation at this bar to the fulfillment of his purpose. He became for the first time conscious of a rising commotion in the street below, and he paused, irresolutely, and listened, his nerves suddenly strung taut. Many voices seemed to be mingled in the excited hum that came to his ears. Bits of phrases, even, could be distinguished. Something had happened down there, it seemed. As he listened, the commotion of spoken sound resolved itself into a tone which, upon his subconscious effort to analyze it, seemed to him to express horror and commiseration with an overtone of fear. The fear communicated itself to him. He shook as the voice of the growing throng, a blended corporate voice, came up to him in sickening waves of apprehension. What if this should mean an interruption? Impatiently wrenching himself away from his preoccupation and back to his more immediate concern with the door, he thrust the key into the lock a third time, this time aggressively, violently. Again he tried to snap the lock. Again it resisted him, unaccountably, devilishly, as it seemed to him. Then, in his pause of desperation, he thought he heard his own name spoken. He could feel his face go white, the roots of his hair prickle. He listened intently, crouched, cat-like, there on the empty landing before the door of his father's apartment. And as he listened, every nerve intent, he heard the entrance door below flung open, and the corporate voice of the throng outside, hitherto muffled and faint, came to him suddenly in a wave of sound, jumbled and obscure as a whole, but with certain strident voices strangely clear and distinct. A shuffle of heavy feet came to his ears, as if several persons were entering the lower hallway, their footsteps falling heavily upon the tiled floor. They would be coming upstairs. He shrank back against the door, that devilish door. If only he could get it open. Something like this, he told himself in a wave of self-pity that swept him. Something like this, unexpected, unforeseen, unreasonable. Something like this was always happening to him. That door. It was an epitome of his futile, worthless life. That had happened to him, just the same kind of thing, a month ago, when he had been turned out of his home. The events of the intervening weeks rushed galloping through his over-tensed mind. And now, as ever since that debacle, there was present with him a kind of unforgettable version of his mother, his poor mother, her face covered with tears, which she made no effort to wipe away. His poor mother, looking at him stricken, through those tears, which blurred her face. And there was his father, the kindly face, set now in a stern mask, pale with deep lines, his father telling him that this was the end. There would be no public prosecution. Was he not their son? But he must go now. His home would no longer be his home. He recalled the dazed days that followed, the mechanical activities of his daily employment, his search half-hearted, for a furnished room. He recalled shuddering the several times when, moved by the mechanism of long-established usage, he had nearly taken the Alliston car for home, which was to be no longer his home. He had not sent back the key. He could not tell why he had kept it. 
he had forgotten to hand it back to his father when he left, and his father, doubtless unthinking, had not suggested its return. That is why he still had it, and here he stood now, on the very threshold of that place which had been home for him for many years, about to make the restitution that would do something to remove the sadness of all the blots on his conscience, and he could not get in. The men, talking with hushed voices, had reached the first landing. Young Philip, caught by a sudden gust of abject terror, shrank against the stubborn door, which, unaccountably, he could not open. Then his mind readjusted itself. He remembered that he had no reason for concealment, for fear. Even though he might be seen here, even though these people should be coming all the way up the stairs, it could not matter. Let him be seen. What of it? He was supposed to live here, of course. It was only a short time since he had actually ceased to live here, and his father had said nothing. No public charges had been made against him. How one's conscience could make one a coward! Under the invigorating stress of this reaction, he straightened himself, stood up boldly, realizing that it might appear odd for him to be discovered standing here, aimlessly on the landing, he started to go downstairs. But by now the narrow staircase was completely blocked by the ascending group. He stopped, halfway from that flight. The men were carrying something, something heavy and of considerable bulk, it would seem. He could not see clearly in the dim light just what it was. He stopped, halfway down, but none of the men carrying the awkward bundle covered with what appeared to be an automobile curtain, looked up, nor appeared to notice him. Neither did the straggling group of men, and a woman or two, who were following them. Fascinated, he gazed at what they were carrying. As they approached, and took the turn in the stairs so that the electric light on the upper landing shone more directly upon it, he looked closer. It was the body of a man. It hung limp and ungainly in their somewhat awkward grasp as they shouldered up toward him. Something about it seemed vaguely familiar. The details presenting themselves to his fascinated gaze in rapid succession. The trouser ends. The shoes. The men turned the last corner in the winding stairway and came into full view. As they turned the corner, the leather curtain slipped, and the face of the dead man was, for a moment, exposed to view. Roger Phillips looked at it, fascinated, horrified. Then one of the men, halting for an instant, drew the corner of the curtain over the face again, and he could no longer see it. The head rolled. The broken body had been grievously crushed. Roger Phillips utterly distraught, cowered, a limp heap, against the unyielding door of his father's apartment. He had looked for one horrific instant into his own distorted, dead face. The men, breathing hard, reached the landing. One of them gingerly shifted his portion of the burden upon the shoulder of another, stepped forward to ring the bell of the Phillips apartment. No one answered the bell. The man rang again, impatiently, insistently. The bell trilled inside the empty apartment. The man stood, silent, shifting uneasily from one foot to another. Behind them, a thin mutter came from the waiting stragglers who had followed them, moved by an inordinate curiosity. "'There's a key stuck in the door,' said the man who had rung the bell. Guess we'd be all right if we opened the door and took the young fellow in. There doesn't seem to be anyone home. A murmur of assent came from the other men. He turned the key to the left, then to the right, and the door opened. 
They carried the broken body inside and carefully laid it out on the sofa in the living room. 